There are times when an overhead view from a mile high is the best way to appreciate the significance of a scriptural passage. And there are other times when a word-by-word -word analysis from inside the text works best. Paul's epistle to the Romans works both ways. On the one hand, Anders Nigren, in a 1949 commentary on Romans, over 70 years ago, he offers, in my view, the most impressive overview I've ever read, especially when it comes to giving an overview of the first eight chapters in the book of Romans, with those eight chapters divided into two equal sections, both of which follow a theme that Paul borrows from the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk had written, The righteous shall live by faith. And Paul turned that around in verse 17 and writes, The righteous by faith shall live. And then in chapters 1 through 4, he describes what it means to be made righteous by faith. And then in the next four chapters, he describes what it means to live, to truly live, free from the fear of judgment, chapter 5, free from the power of sin, chapter 6, free from the burden of law, chapter 7, free from the curse of death, chapter 8. From this mile-high view, we are in the chapter that addresses sin, chapter 6. Now, perhaps you noticed the fun that I had with the brief order for confession and forgiveness during the part of that ritual where we're quoting from 1 John. If we say we have no sin, good for you! Amazing! Incredible! God must be impressed! The thing is, God is not impressed. What the verse actually says is, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And not only that, the truth of God is not in us. I know what you're thinking. We're trying. If we just had a little help, or a little more time, we could do better and get the job done. But that's not what the gospel says or implies. The gospel tells us that God has done what we could not. Just give us a little more time or a little more help. Hold off, Jesus, just a bit. Don't get up there on the cross just yet. I can do better. I will do better. I'm sure I can. I know I can. But that's not God's judgment. If we think we can cross the finish line with just a little more help, or with a little more effort, or with a little more time. Again, not only are we deceiving ourselves, but the scriptures say that we are calling God a liar. This is what 1 John says, just two verses from that place where we quoted. If we think we can save ourselves, if we think Jesus didn't need to get up there on the cross for us, then we're saying that he acted too soon that God's judgment was a little off, that Christ died in vain. And with that, we call God a liar. The truth is, we are saved by grace and by God's grace alone. This is the clear view, not just from a mile high or a thousand miles high. This is the clear view from the highest high point there is. This is the clear view from heaven's high throne. God has done what we could not. That's God's judgment. And that's God's grace. I don't try to do better because I'm trying to get better. I'm just trying to be a witness who, who lets the light of God's love live through me. Who lets the light of Christ's life find a way to reveal itself through me. Now the gospel tells us that the power of sin has been vanquished by the truth of God's grace and the power of God's love in Jesus Christ. 
the last time I looked, sin still had a pretty good hold on me and on the world around me. I don't repeat the brief order for confession because I need to be reminded of sin's hold on me. I need to be reminded of the great victory over sin that Jesus has won on the cross for me and for us all. I'm not trying to be controversial, but, but it's no lie. I am in bondage to sin, and I cannot free myself. Sure, I'd like to say that, that I've been working on it, that it's getting better every day, that I'm getting better in every way. But I've just got to admit that even after four years of seminary and four years of graduate school studying, of all things, Christian ethics, and after 40 years of parish ministry, I am still in bondage to sin, and I still can't free myself. What these years of life and experience have taught me, what I've learned as a Lutheran pastor is, is that it's not about me. The good news of the gospel, whether it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Paul, is that it's not about me. It's about God's grace. It's about Christ's love. It's about the Spirit's presence in my life, in our lives, delivering on God's promise to give new life now and true life forever. It's not a question about sin's role in my life. It's about the new creation that has entered the world with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is what Paul is telling us, even here in chapter 6 of Romans. Paul saw the bigger picture. He was initially blinded by the light he encountered on the road to Damascus. But that light gradually opened his eyes to see the power of God's love, freeing him from the fear of God's judgment, freeing him from the dominion of sin's reign, freeing him from the burden of a law promising what it couldn't deliver, freeing him from the curse of his mortality and from the claims of death. This is the bigger picture that has broken into our world with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just a bigger picture way off in the future in some kind of heavenly bliss. It was present right there, right now. The reign of Christ in the kingdom of God has established a foothold on earth and a beachhead among us in the life of the church, which Paul himself calls the body of Christ. The sociological fact of the matter is that in gathering together Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, slave and free, women and men, this miracle of new community had itself become a, a living testimony to the good news that, that our risen Lord had taken up residence in the body of Christ, otherwise known as the church, where the promise of new creation becomes the gift of life in Christ, alive within each one of us individually and living among us all together. Again, in my judgment, there is no better commentary for understanding the first eight chapters of the book of Romans than what Anders Nygren has produced. For Lutherans, the first eight chapters are more than enough. We are saved by grace through faith. That's the gospel. And the gift of the gospel is a life that is free, free from and free for. Free from sin and death. Free for love and service. The only problem with Nigrin is that the book of Romans does not end with chapter 8. <laughs> there are, in fact, eight more chapters and two major sections that have something to say about the meaning of the book of Romans. Chapters 9 through 11 deal with the theological challenges posed by God's people of old, Israel. And chapters 12 through 14 take up the new creation promised with God's new people, the church. Paul knew. Paul knew that the new life promised with the gift of being saved by grace through faith 
involves being made members of the church, membrane, so to speak, in the body of Christ, participants in the new community of God's people. This communal dimension of salvation is not an added extra for those who need it. This new community is the point of salvation. It is the original aim, the ongoing goal, and in that sense, the ultimate end of the gospel. And this helps to explain why Paul takes up this peculiar question, both in verse 16 and in verse 1 of chapter 6. What shall we say to this? Shall we go on sitting so that grace may abound? By no means! We will go on sinning, whether we say anything or not. But it's not about us. It's about what has come into the world through the good news of the gospel, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what has come into the world is this, a new inclusive community that can show the world what God's grace makes possible, what God's love looks like what the Spirit's presence alive within us and living among us does for us and for the world. Does our sinning negate the resurrection? Does it negate the fulfillment of the promise that has come into our world through the life that is available to us in the church? Now make note of the fact that Paul's asking this question does not lead to a to a plea for personal perfection, but to his proclamation of the promise of baptism, right there in chapter 6. And the promise of baptism is the way through which we become a part of the church, membranes in Christ's body, participants in the mission of the kingdom. Do you not know, Paul writes, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We may not see it, but Paul does. We have been united with Christ in a death like his, because we have been united in Christ by the reach of God's love and by the embrace of God's grace. I guess the point of all this is when it comes to talking about sin and salvation, it's not about throwing up our hands and wondering what the world has come to. It's about celebrating the good news of what has come to our world. The revelation of God's grace the resurrection of Christ's life, the triumph of life over death, of love over loss, the gift of new life now, and true life forever. As we live in the promises that are ours and allow God's grace and love and life to shine through us, as we offer all that we are and everything we do as a witness to what it means that we are alive in Jesus' name.